Did you folks enjoy that song? In the two or three times I have heard it, it has become one of my very favorite hymns. Thank you very much, Chuck, for sharing that with us. That really sets the tone for the whole week in a most positive way. Well, it's a delight for my family and myself to be with you for this week. We counted a special privilege to visit the campus. I had the privilege of uh, teaching some classes here last fall, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, we enjoyed our, my, my, I was the only one who could come, but I enjoyed it. And uh, we had a special time together. Whole family is here this week, my son, his wife, my wife, and so we're just going to enjoy this camp meeting time with all you good folk here and get reacquainted with a lot of good friends. Tonight's message, it has been popping up in uh, a number of situations over the course of the last 10 years. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? And sometimes, somehow, you know, that doesn't quite seem like the question that would be asked to Seventh-day Adventists. But it is becoming more and more prominent. And I believe that I would like to address that subject first this weekend as we begin this week of meetings together. Because it is extremely important for us to understand. It is not, it is not about Sabbath and Sunday. It is about the gospel. It is about the way of salvation, how salvation works, and we're going to focus on that a little bit tonight. I'm going to, the reason that it struck my attention, and this was several years ago, was in a uh, review article that appeared in 1999 that uh, had a little quiz in one of the columns, and we're going to go through that quiz tonight. I'm going to ask you to think very carefully about the um, positions, the uh, issues at stake in this little quiz. Don't raise your hand or don't blurt it out. Just think about it and decide what you think is the right answer to what we're going to go through right here. And uh, we're going to put it up on the screen so you can kind of tell what, uh, what you're doing and what the issues are. The quiz goes like this. There is an A and a B, or if you'd like, a 1 and a 2, odd or even. Which do you think is the right conclusion for how salvation works? And so we'll, we'll leave it that way, odd or even. Here is the first statement. Our right standing with God is based solely on what Christ has done for us. For us. Hmm. True or false? Or the even statement here, our right standing with God is based on what Christ has done for us and in us. So which is the right understanding here? For us or for us and in us? That's the first question. Now you got the idea? Here's how they go. The odd one, we are justified through the merits of Christ alone. Or, we are justified by God through the merits of Christ and through the work of His Holy Spirit in our lives. So Christ alone, or Christ and the Holy Spirit. Next one. God gives us right standing with Him by accounting or, may, or declaring us righteous in His sight. Or the even statement, God gives us right standing with him by actually making us righteous in his sight. Declaring us right, making us right. Next one, the last one. After accepting Christ's righteousness. In other words, you have accepted Christ, you have been accepted by him. After accepting Christ's righteousness... In other words, after you've been justified, a believer experiences the new birth, which results in a transformed life and character. So after you've been justified, then you experience the new birth, or the even statement, after having a new birth experience in which a person's life and character is transformed, that person is then justified before God. There's our little quiz. A column, 
of the odd statements, even statements. What is the right understanding of the gospel? Now, remember one thing as we go through this. More important than any prophetic understanding or even a doctrinal understanding is a correct understanding of how we stand with Christ daily by faith. The relationship that we have that gives us confidence that we are safe in His hands, that we have right standing with Him at all times. So this is really bottom line. It is not peripheral. It is not a minor issue. It is very crucial. Now I'm going to read a little more from this same column, this quiz that was presented to us. If you had placed true after any or all of the even-numbered ones, that's the second column, then to some degree at least you are inclined toward the teaching that Roman Catholicism has embraced since the Council of Trent in the 16th century. All the odd-numbered statements reflect the biblical teaching that our right standing with God is based not even on what God can do in us, but solely on what Christ had done in our stead through His life and death. So there we have. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? That was the direct challenge in this particular column. Protestant on the left-hand side, Catholic on the right-hand side. This latter position, the second column, has been attractive to Roman Catholics and some Adventists. And then he said, the even-numbered statements reflect the idea that our right standing with God is based not just on Christ's merits imputed to us, but also on what Christ does in our lives. So again, there you have the uh, challenge. It was restated, uh, that I was reading from 1999, it was restated in another article about a year later, 2000, by the same author. Let me read a little more so you get the full picture of what is being said here. Since the Reformation, Lutherans, along with most all Protestants, have insisted that justification by faith is an act by which God declares us righteous. That's over in that left-hand column. The Reformers taught that justification was something that God does for us, not in us. Nothing that happens in us gives us merit that can in any way justify us in God's sight. We're justified only by what Christ did for us, apart from us, outside of us. And uh, perhaps that's uh, sufficient to understand uh, this perspective as to uh, what the challenge is for us today. How are we going to deal with this? What is going to be our solution? How will we respond? Well, when I read uh, these uh, particular articles, my mind went back 30 years to Pacific Union College. In the years between about 1976 to 1979, when I was teaching at that college. And of course, you may know that there was another gentleman during those years who also spent a few years teaching at Pacific Union College by the name of Desmond Ford. He was not the only one that was involved. There was a friend of his by the name of Robert Brinsmead that came over from Australia as well, and then another friend of theirs by the name of Jeffrey Paxton. Not an Adventist, but very knowledgeable about Seventh-day Adventism. And he wrote a book after that time called The Shaking of Adventism. It was printed in 1977. Now listen very carefully to what he said in that book. Whereas Rome taught that justification means to make the believer just by the work of inner renewal in his heart, that's the second column, the reformers taught that justification is the declaration by God that the believer is just on the grounds of the righteousness of Christ alone, which is outside the believer. So the reformers, the Protestants, taught the first column. To focus on the indwelling Christ is to abandon the Reformation doctrine of justification. Now that's a very strong statement. To focus on the indwelling Christ is to abandon the Reformation doctrine of justification. The grace of God always refers to God and never to what is in the believer's heart. Those were some statements in that book that uh, came 
out during those years. And then I came across another little um, um, paper that was circulated at that time by one who was very uh, much enamored of Dr. Ford's teaching during that time, and he had a quiz in his paper as well. What work gives me acceptance with God? The work that Christ did when he lived on this earth or the work the Holy Spirit does in my life? What work gives me acceptance with God? And I think you know what he's going to say. The work that Christ did when he lived on earth. And then he asked the question, where does justification take place? In the experience of the believer on earth or in the courts of God in heaven? And his answer will be, in the courts of God in heaven is where our justification takes place. And finally he said, what does the verb to justify mean? To justify means to declare righteous or to justify means to make righteous? Well, of course, he's going to say again, to declare righteous. So, again, a very distinct parallel here. And then in his magazine, Present Truth, Robert Brinsmead said exactly the same thing during those years uh, of uh, very much controversy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As I say, when I came across these articles in the years 1999 and 2000, I had all kinds of flashbacks. Because, brothers and sisters, the issues that Dr. Ford was concerned with at Pacific Union College during those years were not the issues of 1844 and a judgment. That only came out later, in about 1979. The issues he was concerned with as he spent his time trying to persuade in Sabbath school classes and in various venues around the country were the issues of justification by faith. That was his concern. He wanted to get the Adventist church turned around on its understanding of how a person is saved. His concern was the salvation issue, and he spent his focus and his time on that. So when I saw this challenge, again, not this time in a seminar, in a college classroom, but in the pages of the Adventist Review, you can imagine that I had some concerns, that I was a little bit unsettled by this, because I thought perhaps we had dealt with that. I thought maybe it was taken care of. But things that are not dealt with keep, keep coming back, don't they? And they don't seem to come to any final conclusion. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to try to examine Scripture and the spirit of prophecy for a few minutes to see which of those two columns is really biblical, which is Protestant. What is the true understanding of righteousness by faith? So if you have your Bible handy, let's go on a little search. Let's start with Romans. Romans chapter 5. And the very first verse says very simply, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification gives us peace. Justification gives us the assurance that God has accepted us. And folks, tonight all we're going to do is to study justification. We're not going to touch sanctification tonight. Just justification. If you look back, because Paul's theme through this entire section is justification by faith, look back to chapter 4 and verse 7. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So a synonym for justification is simply forgiveness. It is covered. Our sins are covered. We have forgiveness, and the Lord is not imputing our past sins to us. Now I want to share a statement. I'll be reading some statements from the Bible and some from the Spirit of Prophecy tonight. This one is from Mount of Blessing, page 114. Listen very carefully now. God's forgiveness, so remember now that's justification. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. Now, when it says not merely, that means it is that, but more. It is a judicial act. It is a statement by God, but it is more than that. It is, this is forgiveness now, it is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness 
Again, justification. When he prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Interesting. Within me. A new heart. A new spirit. Forgiveness. Synonyms? Which column does that sound like? Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. To be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The Lord says, a new heart will I give unto thee. So again, remembering we're focusing on pardon. We're not focusing on sanctification. We're focusing on forgiveness. And here it says it is to be renewed in the spirit of our mind with a new heart. Let's go back to the Bible for a minute. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, reading verses 5 through 7. And again, it's talking about how our salvation takes place. Verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. So there's the key word. He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed in us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified... By His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So notice the whole theme here is saving us, heirs of eternal life, being justified. So this is talking about the justifying act that takes place. And now how does that take place in verse 5? Two phrases. The washing of regeneration. Washing. Is that just what happens when we go under the waters of baptism? Well, it is that, but it should be much more than that. Is that correct? Because there was a thief on the cross who never went under the waters of baptism. And yet I am sure that there was a washing that took place in his heart that day on the cross. And it was the washing of regeneration. Regeneration is making something new, producing something new. And then it says in the next phrase, renewing of the Holy Ghost. Which column, folks? Which column? The Holy Spirit is involved in it, and it is renewing, and it is inward. Let's try some, another text. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Now what Paul is saying here sounds like he's got things all backwards in terms of logical progression. Verse 11, And such were some of you, meaning thieves, covetous, etc., but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Did he get his theology all confused there? He started out with washing, then he went to sanctifi sanctification, and then he went to justification. Shouldn't that have been reversed? Justification, then washing, then sanctification, according to the first column over there. The acceptance first the declaring first, then the washing and the sanctifying. Or for Paul, was the saving act one process, which is just named by different names to help us better understand it in the whole process. Is washing and sanctifying and justifying really the same thing then? Notice carefully, the word sanctify means to set apart for a holy use. Isn't that what happens when we're justified, forgiven? We're set apart. And we are washed. That's inward. And please notice, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are involved in that process, aren't they? Not just Jesus Christ. Not just what he did in the courts of heaven. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Let's look here at what things are equal or parallel or synonymous with each other. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 1.
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse, go down to verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Look at those verses now. In Christ Jesus, in verse 1, in verse 9, the Spirit of God, in the Spirit, first of all, and then the Spirit of God dwells in us. And then verse 10, if Christ be in you. Don't those all sound like, they're saying about the same thing in different words. They're very synonymous. In Christ, Christ in, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in. It seems like they're all saying essentially the same thing, and column one is not quite what they're saying. Let's try another statement or two from the writings of Ellen White. Christ Object Lessons 163. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. Please notice that the sinner is now coming to the cross and surrendering to Jesus Christ. There is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We're talking about justification, justifying, new heart, new creature, new creation. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1098. By receiving his imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. How do we get imputed righteousness? Through the Holy Spirit, not just on the work that Christ did 2,000 years ago. And maybe the clearest one of all is in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 394. Having made us righteous through the imputed righteousness of Christ, God pronounces us just. Which comes first? Pronouncing and declaring and accounting or making? Having made us righteous, God pronounces us just seems to me that there's a very, very strong inference that the second column is truly the way of the gospel. Let's try a couple of more Bible texts. John chapter 3. You know what John 3 is all about. Jesus and Nicodemus having that famous conversation. And of course, we always focus on John 3, 16, but look at verses 14 and 15 for just a moment. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So to believe in Jesus Christ means you have eternal life. Now how exactly did Jesus say that would happen? Go back to verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So how is it that we can believe in Jesus Christ and have eternal life? Isn't it through the new birth experience that then produces that life in us, that justification, that acceptance with God? And it is through the Spirit, not apart from the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 22 to 24. Let's look for things that are kind of equal to each other again. Synonymous. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the new man is created, and the same phrase, renewed in the spirit of your mind, is how the new man is created. 
One more text. Galatians chapter 2. Just back a few pages. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 16. Just to make sure we have the context right, in verse 16 it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So we are talking here about justification. Well, skip down to verse 20. How is this justification described? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So justification is Christ living in me, not outside of me. One more statement from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 366. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. Doesn't that sound a lot like new birth? The entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So, my friends, I'll leave it up to you to decide which of the two columns is more biblical, more in harmony with inspiration. I am firmly convinced that column two is the biblical column, the Protestant column and something has gone tragically wrong in the labeling of these two columns. Now, this is not inspired, but at least I wanted to share one thing with you that may just uh, give us a little insight that we're not just out in left field on this one with our own little tangent. I came across this statement from Elder Jan Paulson, our past General Conference president, He says, we make an unfortunate mistake when we define justification so narrowly as to make it mean only a legal declaration of acquittal on the first column. When a man is justified, he receives at the same time both the imputed righteousness of Christ and the Holy Spirit into his heart. I thought that was a nice statement, fairly clear statement. Another uh, of our scholars, a New Testament scholar, Ivan Blazin, said it this way, Justification involves the reception of the Spirit. Without question, the reception of the Spirit belongs with the event of justification. In this perspective, those who believe this believe that the Holy Spirit is only involved in our sanctification, not in our justification. And yet here, that doesn't seem to be the perspective of this, uh, uh, you, th- this article. He said in the same author, Ivan Blazin, an examination of all the uses of the phrase in Christ indicates that it refers to a personal connection with Christ and not just to something that is legally true. So this has been a position of Seventh-day Adventism for a long, long time. Justification is an inner work of the Holy Spirit. Justification is a work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. It is a making righteous. In fact, if you want to go way back to E.J. Wagoner in one of his presentations, here is how he said it. Being justified, that is made righteous or doers of the law. Being justified, that is being made righteous. And you just have to realize how counter that is to the theology of most Christian churches on salvation. That is a bold statement that justification is making righteous. Very few Christian scholars believe that to be true. Elder Wagoner said it again. He justifies the ungodly by making him godly. He justifies the ungodly by making him godly. Well, as I say, those are not inspired statements, but at least they give some added perspective to this to help us understand that this is not just some strange belief in Adventism. All right, so what's the problem? How in the world did this come up? That the first column is Protestant and the second column is Catholic. And if you believe the second column, you will be labeled as a Catholic. And that has been going on for about 10 years now in our Seventh-day Adventist church. This is a rather new development in this kind of labeling. 
So I decided I'd go back and uh, check some of the foremost Protestant reformer statements on justification by faith, Martin Luther. Let me just share them with you. I'm not going to give references because they're involved in, you know, volume 32 and volume 34 and volume 26 of Luther's works. He wrote a lot of things. But here are a few of his statements. This movement of justification is the work of God in us. Which column, please? He, therefore, Christ, therefore, draws us into himself and transforms us. It is thus in Romans 5, we are justified by faith. Transforms, that makes us righteous. Therefore, the Christ who is grasped by faith and who lives in the heart is the true Christian righteousness on account of which God counts us righteous and grants us eternal life. Did you catch that? The Christ who lives in the heart is righteousness. On account of that, God counts or declares us righteous. The living in precedes the declaring. But so far as justification is concerned, so he again is limiting his, his uh, statement here to justification. But so far as justification is concerned, Christ and I must be so closely attached that he lives in me and I in him. Faith must be taught correctly, namely, that by it you are so cemented to Christ that he and you are as one person which cannot be separated. This faith couples Christ and me more intimately than a husband is coupled to his wife. Wow. Christ in me, just the same as what we read in our last text. Another statement. Then what does justify? The Holy Spirit who justifies. Straight out, the Holy Spirit justifies. At the beginning of his sermons on John chapter 3, the chapter we just read, he said, this chapter declares above all else that sublime topic, faith in Christ which alone justifies us before God. So what is he saying? The new birth chapter is about justification, not sanctification. It's about justification. So there we have a strange anomaly, don't we? The one who is claimed to be the foremost Protestant reformer of that time is now stating what is in column two, which is supposed to be Catholic. What is going on? Well, I'll tell you exactly what's going on. And we can read it from people who have been, uh, spent their lives studying some of these things. Carefully listen. In time, Lutherans began to draw an increasingly sharp distinction between the event of being declared righteous, which they call justification, and the process of being made righteous, which they came to call sanctification. Who did that? Lutherans. Not Luther. Followers of Luther. Luther's concept of justification, his concept of the presence of God within the believer, all were rejected or radically modified by those who followed him. Isn't that incredible? Luther, Luther's understanding of justification and salvation were either rejected or radically modified by the Lutherans who followed him. And, of course, the one who began that process was the one that he tutored and trained as his associate, Melanchthon. And he began to move down that road. And then another one followed by the name of Martin Chemnitz, who began to codify Lutheran teachings. And he said, there is no scripture evidence for internalized righteousness. Christ in you is figurative. We are counted as righteous even though we are not really righteous. Can you believe that? But that is exactly what was taught at Pacific Union College in the late 70s. And what is coming back again in the quiz that I've just shared with you. So the reality is, my friends, that Orthodox Lutheranism followed Chemnitz and rejected Luther's position. 
strange developments in church history. So I'm going to give you a tongue full of a, of a, of a statement here. Legal only justification, which is the first column, is post-Reformation scholastic Lutheranism. How about that? Post-Reformation, not Reformation. Post-Reformation scholastic Lutheranism, the scholars who followed Luther. And that understanding of the gospel and justification has penetrated into most of the Protestant churches, especially the conservative Protestant churches, the Baptists, etc., that have come to understand that as the correct understanding of the gospel and righteousness by faith. And so there you have a little bit of the history of that development. Well, as you have seen, there's another column, isn't there? What do you think we need to understand if, and I'm going to now redo these columns, somehow a mistake has been made. The first column is not Protestant, and the second column is not Catholic. The first column is evangelical, and the second column is biblical or Protestant, if you want to take the great leader of the Protestant faith, Martin Luther. So we've got a really, really serious problem here. The way of salvation that we are being told must be followed is not Adventist and is not biblical. It's an evangelical position coming down through scholastic Lutheranism, transferred through many churches, and now believed by most Christian churches and not the gospel at all. So what do we need to find out? We need to know what that third column is all about, don't we? If column two is not Catholic, what is Catholic? What is the Catholic way of salvation? What is their understanding of how a person gets saved? And what I found was most interesting was in the very same columns, uh, articles rather, that I shared with you earlier, uh, in those very same uh, uh, articles was a very clear demonstration, designation of how the Catholic system of salvation works. And so we're just going to kind of go through that a little bit, see what we can come up with. In the Catholic system, justification is infused into the life of the believer. Now, what in the world does that mean? Here we've got imputed, and then we've got imparted, and now we've got infused. What are we talking about here? Well, basically, the word imputed means credited. Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. We are counted before him as though we had never sinned. The word imparted means a sharing of Christ's righteousness that he shares with us through the Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. But infused, what's that? Well, folks, if you were in an accident and you'd lost some blood... And we're taken to the hospital, and the only way to save your life was a blood transfusion. You would be infused with someone else's blood. Now, let's say about three days later, you had a change of heart. and You say, no, I think I did the wrong thing. Please take that blood out of me, okay? That's not going to happen, is it? Because when the blood is infused into you, it becomes part of your whole system. And it is there to stay. So infused righteousness means kind of like filling up a pitcher with righteousness, and that's yours, and you have it forever. You, it belongs to you. It is yours. It is your possession. So imputed means credited. Imparted means shared on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, as long as your hand is in the hand of Jesus Christ. And infused means made part of, to stay. So that's what the word infused means. Righteousness is infused into the life of the believer. Now, how does it get there? How does this righteousness get infused into you so you have it? Well, not by praying, not by studying the Bible, but through the sacraments administered by the Roman Catholic Church itself. No other way. You will not be righteous by praying, surrendering, confessing, believing, unless the sacraments are applied to your life. And what does that mean? Rome teaches that the, all of this, by the way, are on these articles that I began with. 
Rome teaches us that this saving merit doesn't remain outside of us, but becomes something that happens inside a person, a change that gives that person merit before God. Ah, now since you've been infused with righteousness, you have this righteousness within you, therefore you can merit something. Here is a catechism statement. We can merit for ourselves and for all others the graces needed to obtain eternal life because we have been infused with righteousness, because now that is part of our system. The sacraments have given that to us, and so that is the way that we receive this righteousness. Well, I could say it uh, several ways, but I'll just read it again. The Roman Catholic system is based on the crucial notion that all that Christ has done or does for a person comes mediated through the church itself. Salvation is dispensed to the faithful only through the church and its sacraments and priesthood. That's the only way you receive salvation. The Catholic way of salvation is a vast sacramental system that sees grace as being mediated through the sacraments administered by ordained priests. The sacraments and the human priests are the channels of saving grace. So it's very clear that that's the only way that you receive salvation grace. Now there's one other little column, one other part of that column. When a person goes to confession, the penitent receives absolution of sins from the priest or confessor. The guilt of sin and its eternal penalties are absolved by the priest, but the temporal, the earthly penalties, are not. These latter penalties must be satisfied or worked off through indulgences. Now, what are indulgences? These indulgences draw upon the so-called treasury of merit, a vast reservoir of excess merit that Jesus and the saints have gained through their righteous lives. So you see, Jesus and the saints got more merit by their good works than they needed for their salvation. So what happens to that extra merit that they really didn't need? Well, it gets put in the heavenly bank. Access to this treasury is the prerogative of the church and is obtained by the faithful through various actions, observances, or financial purchases. Indulgences. You thought that disappeared in the 16th and 17th century after Martin Luther spoke out against it? What about the year 2000, in which the Pope declared that the year of indulgences? If you deprive yourself of some food, some delicacy for a period of time, if you go on a pilgrimage or you contribute to the church financially, you can participate in this treasury of merits, which will provide extra merits because you're a little short on them, you understand. So you need some extra merits for your loved ones, extra merits for yourself. And there's a whole bank full of merits, and we will tell you how to get them. Just work with us, is the Catholic Church's position. So now, I ask you a question. Is that third column anywhere close to the second column? Like it at all? It's totally different, is it? isn't it? The third column talks about salvation coming to us through certain things that the church does, and you do what they ask you to do, and then you can merit eternal life. Whereas the second column is talking about Christ dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. He makes us righteous. We participate in the new birth, and therefore we receive justification. I've tried to summarize it in my own mind with a little illustration that I have uh, jotted down for myself. The Catholic view of justification is like a scuba diver, fills his tanks with air, goes down under the water and has a great time swimming around the water, under, the, under the water on his own because he has plenty of air in the tanks on his back. In other words, a quality of righteousness infused into the soul. He's got it. It's his possession. The air tanks are his. They belong to him. He has righteousness infused into his soul. Whereas the evangelical position, you don't have any air tanks at all. You just dive into the water. 
and a successful dive is recorded, you are declared a diver. And then it's up to you if you can find any air pockets down there. In other words, Christ's righteousness declared immediately a free dive. What is the true Protestant or biblical position? Remember the old-fashioned divers, the big old clunky suits, the big old heavy helmets? What was the way of their survival down there at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> they had an airline, didn't they? And the guys up on top had to be mighty sure they kept the pumps moving or that man down there was not going to survive. And they had to be very careful that they did not get that airline punctured in any way by what they were exploring. And that is Christ's righteousness shared continually, which is imparted. Three views of salvation. If we aren't receiving the air of righteousness continually in our hearts, we're into one or the other of those columns and not the scriptural way. Well, there we have a little summary of what we're talking about right here. And um, I kind of want to finish up with a, um, a statement that I won't mention the author of it, but uh, he's not far from us tonight. And I think you might recognize it. I'm sure he will recognize it. What we are dealing with here, there are only two distinct, distinct streams. There is the authentic stream of the everlasting gospel, and there is the stream which is to be found enshrined today in the evangelical gospel. The two are absolutely watertight, logical, and coherent concepts. But as Sister White says, men start with a wrong premise and bring everything to bear upon it, which is exactly what evangelical Protestantism has done. So you have two different concepts of salvation there in the evangelical and the biblical positions because we're not going to focus on the Catholic. The one that's challenging us right now is the evangelical position on righteousness by faith, which was promoted strongly by Desmond Ford 30 years ago and has been promoted down through the years here and there again and is now being front and center, being declared that if you don't understand this correctly, you're really Catholic. And, of course, you don't want to be Catholic. What is the underlying premise underneath all of these uh, on the evangelical side that makes it work? Friends, it's original sin. You've heard me talk about it a few times already. It is the teaching that we are born sinners automatically condemned because of the nature we inherit. And therefore, of course, we are not going to be able to live without sinning because we will be sinning by nature until Jesus comes. And therefore, that first column makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, so there is the underlying premise. And then it says, These concepts have now plunged into the Baptist Church, the Church of Christ, and even into other more conservative groups. Incredibly, they are now making great inroads into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I think that is the incredible part. Today we are in no man's land in Seventh-day Adventism if we try to integrate some of these evangelical concepts into Seventh-day Adventism. There is no consistency in having part of one and part of the other. And you know what we're doing today in trying to sort out the gospel? We're having a smorgasbord. We're having a buffet supper. A little of this and a little of that. This sounds good and I like that over there too. Even though they totally uh, make no sense with each other, but they're kind of nice, and I like it that way. There is no way we can safely accept part of the everlasting gospel and part of the evangelical gospel because error will eventually always win out. Let's be very sure of that. It happened that way in the early centuries with Sabbath and Sunday, and it's really dominating the Christian world today and is an extreme issue now in our Seventh-day Adventist churches. Many Seventh-day Adventist preachers are presenting a hybrid system of theology and have a mixture of the everlasting gospel and evangelical Protestantism. And the concluding sentence, the more we as Seventh-day Adventists neglect the study of God's Word, the greater will be our inability to perceive the lack of consistency in the presentations, either in sermons or in books. As Jones and Wagoner might have said a hundred years ago, and they did say it right in front of the general conference, you're saying amen in all the wrong places. 
because today we are saying amen to deadly error in our Seventh-day Adventist churches, error which will destroy our own walk with Christ and which will destroy the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So I really believe this is a crucial issue, my friends. If you continue to believe in column two as the biblical understanding of the gospel, be prepared for labels to come your way. They are coming more and more often. I am hearing it more often than I ever heard it before in my lifetime. I want to finish up with Ephesians chapter 4, if you'll turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. My friends, these winds of doctrine are going to blow us all over the place if we're not careful. And we are just susceptible to those things if we're not studying the Word of God for ourselves and growing up in all things. The real bottom line of the first column, my friends, is that we can't perfectly obey the law of God. Therefore, he has to declare us righteous even when we are not righteous. That's the bottom line. We cannot consistently obey. Therefore, we must have a theology of salvation which allows some disobedience in the salvation process because we're all going to be that way until Jesus comes. That's column one. More of our theology is formed by our experience than our objective study. And if our failures have been in certain areas, we desperately want a theology that will give us some peace while we know that our hearts are not right with God. Brothers and sisters, let's be sure we know what we believe. Let's be sure when we hear some things like this that we understand where it's coming from, what the background of it is, so that we are not caught in these many winds of doctrine. May God help us to be true and faithful to his word and follow the way of salvation as Jesus outlined it. Thank you. We hope you have been blessed by this message. If you would like more information about other programs or sermons by this speaker, please contact EGN at 1-800-774-3566. That's 1-800-774-3566. On behalf of the entire EGN team, thank you for watching.